let's move on to our real meeting, uh, which is common paddling hazards and how to avoid them. Um, oh I could go ahead and give you an introduction to our good friend Molden, but I suspect he'll do that himself. So without any further ado, Molten Avery, take it away. My fellow oopsters, welcome to Common Paddling Hazards and How to Avoid Them. I've been paddling for over 50 years, but my most memorable trip was the first time I ever got into a kayak because within half an hour, I came within a whisker of dying. Almost got killed the very first time I went kayaking. There was a little creek running through town and it was flooded because of rain and some friends with a local university outing club said, hey, you wanna go kayaking? I said, sure, but I don't have a kayak. Uh, so they lent me a kayak and a spray skirt and nothing about this looked dangerous, but the creek was really high. So I'm paddling along this little creek and a footbridge comes into view and the creek was usually about 10 feet below the bridge. But now with the recent rains, the there wasn't an inch of space between the bottom of the bridge and the water. And I didn't know any better. I paddled right up to it. Nose of my kayak bumped into the bridge. The current turned the kayak sideways and sucked it under the bridge. And the only reason I'm alive is because I reached up at the last second and grabbed the bridge railing as the kayak was ripped off my body. That kayak got pinned under there for about 10 minutes. And talk about scared. I didn't get into a kayak for around 10 years after that. I started paddling canoes instead. Paddled a lot, became a whitewater canoe instructor, learned all about the hazards. I think one of the major uh, hurdles that we face in promoting paddling safety is that most of the hazards don't look dangerous at all. So people underestimate them. And I take a look at this, uh, this quote. This is from a local Facebook paddling group in Oregon. Kayaking on flat water doesn't take much skill. You can watch a five minute YouTube video and you know what you need for flat water kayaking. Sounds a lot like me uh, back on that first kayak trip because you really don't know what you don't know. And particularly in outdoor sports, being unaware of these hazards gets a lot of people hurt or killed each year. They never think bad stuff's going to happen, but it does. And the most common phrase we hear from survivors is, I never thought that, I never thought I was going to capsize. I never thought the weather could change that fast. I never thought my kayak would blow away. I never thought it would be that hard to put my PFD on in the water. And I never thought the water was that cold. Did you know that according to US Coast Guard statistics, over half of all paddle sports accidents are fatal. They're five times more likely to be fatal than open motorboats and 13 times more likely than jet skis. And in a way it makes sense when you think about it because when we capsize and wind up in the water, uh, we do so far more often uh, than motorboats or jet skis. And a lot of paddlers don't have any idea how to recover from a capsize. You can group most of the common paddling hazards into three categories, cold water, adverse weather, and hazardous waters. And let's look at cold water first. What do we mean by cold water? And first, let me say you should treat any water temperature below 70 Fahrenheit with caution. But to really put that question in perspective, let's take a look at some different temperatures. I'm just going to read the Fahrenheit scale. The Celsius is there next to it for our mates who have advanced to the metric system. 99.6 is your core body temperature. That's the deep body temperature. That's your brain, heart, lungs, kidneys, that sort of thing. If you take your temperature with an oral thermometer, the average is 98.6. 95 is where we medically define hypothermia. 91 is your skin temperature and 85 uh, Fahrenheit water the water actually feels cool to your skin. Now, if you ask most people how they think 85 Fahrenheit water would feel, I think most of them would tend to say, well, that sounds warm. And it is warm, uh, except it doesn't feel that way because it's lower than your actual skin temperature. So if you get into 85 Fahrenheit water, it's going to feel cool to you. Now, this is where it starts to get really interesting. 
The International Olympic Committee requires pool temperatures to be between 77 and 82. Now, why is that? It's because they don't want the water temperature to affect performance. They want an environmentally neutral playing field for these athletes. And we know from scientific studies that human respiration is adversely affected when the water temperature is below 76. How we define cold water has some real safety implications. The US Coast Guard used to define it as anything below 60, then they changed it to 70. Some paddle sports organizations have their own definitions. For example, the American Canoe Association uses 60 degree Fahrenheit as their definition for the cutoff point below which they recommend that paddlers wear thermal protection. So in other words, ACA says, if it's below 60, then you should wear a wetsuit or a dry suit. The organization American Whitewater is even worse. Their definition is 50 Fahrenheit, below which they recommend thermal protection. And that's a problem because those 60 and 50 Fahrenheit definitions have no scientific basis. And in fact, they're dangerously misleading. Now, why is that? It's because most people will experience maximum intensity cold shock between 50 and 60 degrees. So from a safety standpoint, it doesn't make any sense to set the recommendation for thermal protection that low because there's no safety margin when you set it at 60 degrees. Now moving down the scale, immersion in 40 degree Fahrenheit water is very painful. It, it actually feels, the water feels like it's burning your skin. 32 Fahrenheit, fresh water freezes, 28 Fahrenheit, salt water freezes. The thing about cold water that I'm always impressed with is that it doesn't look dangerous. It doesn't even sound dangerous. If you say 50 Fahrenheit water to someone, they mentally compare it to 50 Fahrenheit air. And they think, well, gee, it doesn't sound that cold, but there's a huge difference because this, what you're looking at in these pictures, this is what happens when you fall into 50 Fahrenheit water without thermal protection. It's a life-threatening event. You have complete loss of breathing control, huge gasps, and if you gasp underwater, you've just drowned. I've got a separate one hour class on cold water safety. If you hadn't taken it, I think it'd be a good idea. In the meantime, you can go to our website and read all about it. Adverse weather, let's take a peek at that. Lots of paddling advice tells you that you can skip wetsuits or dry suits as long as you paddle close to shore in protected waters. It's really bad advice because it says absolutely nothing about things like wind shadows, wave shadows, winds blowing offshore, that sort of thing. And in fact, uh, out on the water, as many of you know, strong wind is really hard to deal with. It can, it, it can cause conditions to change instantly. Groups get separated, kayaks capsize, kayaks get blown away. I would say always check the weather forecast before you go paddling. Looking at hazardous waters, there are a lot of things here uh, that constitute potential hazards out on the water. The bottom line uh, that I would say with respect to these hazards is that they aren't the problem. They're a fact of life in outdoor regulation, uh, outdoor recreation. And the real problem is lack of knowledge and preparation because plenty of paddlers encounter cold water, adverse weather and hazardous waters without getting into trouble. In fact, many paddlers play in those environments. Now let's take a peek at contributing factors. Contributing factors are the reasons that people get into trouble. We see them again and again in close calls and fatalities. They're things that you can change. They're things that you can practice and prepare for and that you can control. The first incident uh, that, that we're going to look at here uh, occurred on the coast of Maine. And as we review this incident, I'll show you how all of this stuff I've just talked about fits together. 
This was a fatal accident. Three paddlers got into trouble and only one survived. Ed Brackett, the guide on this particular trip was a member of the Maine Association of Sea Kayak Guides and Instructors. And he'd been a registered guide in Maine for 14 years. And those credentials do sound impressive, but I'd say what really matters is whether or not a kayaking trip is conducted safely. Here's the accident location on the coast of Maine. And this is an overview of the area. The tidal range here, by the way, is 10 feet. So let's take a look at this uh, in term and think, think about that tidal range. This right here, this whole Y-shaped area, that's Goldsboro Bay. And it's six and a half miles from the mouth of the bay here uh, back into the reaches. So you've got twice a day, 10 feet of that water goes rushing out the mouth of the bay. And that's a tremendous volume of water. On this particular day, the wind was southwest at 10, five to 10 miles an hour and the seas were two, two feet, water temperature was 52 degrees. This was their kayak route. What they planned to do was leave Korea Harbor and go across the mouth of Goldsboro Bay. This was gonna be a four and a half mile round trip out and back. And these little islands along the way, they're called the Sally Islands. They were gonna explore those. This is the guide's kayak, Ed Brackett. It's a solid seaworthy boat with watertight bulkheads. Notice uh, the pump right here on the foredeck. That's likely the only pump they had between all three kayaks. And you notice there's no spare, no spare paddle anywhere on the boat. This is uh, Ed Brackett on a previous trip with clients. Now you noticed none of them are dressed for the water temperature. There's no thermal protection. Water temperatures on the coast of Maine get above 60 Fahrenheit only six weeks of the year. And on June 22nd, the date this trip was taken, the water temperature was 50 to 52 and all three of them were wearing shorts and t-shirts. Taking another look at the route that they were planning to take, this is right again at the mouth of Goldsboro Bay and the mouth of the bay is one mile wide, but look what happens here because of the islands. You've got these, these gaps, 600 yards here, 475 yards here, and that, that's the area that the water has to be channeled to uh, or channeled from as it's, as it's going out into the ocean on the ebb tide and the current speeds up when it passes through those islands. Um, after this accident, Michael Hunt, who's a lobsterman and the assistant harbor master at Korea said, when the tide goes out between those islands, it's no place to be. So what happened? Well, they were out on the water on the return leg of that four and a half uh, mile planned trip the ebb tide was moving at its maximum rate and a squall blew in from the Southwest with 30 mile an hour winds. This picture isn't that squall, but it shows an approaching squall line. You can see the rain coming down onto the water. These things are characterized by very strong wind and rain along the leading edge and relatively calm water in front of them. The thing about these squall lines when you're out on the water is that one like the one they encountered traveling at 30 miles an hour, a storm that's five miles away can be on top of you in 10 minutes. It doesn't give you much time. You have very limited options, either get ashore or raft up. When that thunderstorm, when that squall line moved in, uh, they didn't have time to act and conditions changed very, very quickly because when the wind hit that ebb tide running out between those islands at its maximum flow, all of a sudden, the water situation around those islands changed. Suddenly, you've got very confused seas. You've got waves that are three to five feet high. They're steep. Some of them are breaking. 
And as the harbor master said, it went from no wind to 30 miles an hour, just like that. So what happened? Oh, one other thing I want to mention. The marine weather forecast for the afternoon called for scattered thunderstorms and the probability of precipitation was 50%. So when the, when the squall hit them, the combination of the higher wind, the ebb tide, the existing two to three foot uh, uh, ocean swell, all of that created conditions that they were unable to handle. But I would say this, this wasn't a rogue event. It was the predictable result of the interaction of wind, ocean swell, the ebb tide in a very exposed location. This trip really had no margin for error. All three kayaks capsized, two of them blew away and were lost, and one of those was the guides. His VHF radio was in the hatch. This left them with no way, no way to call for help. So as soon as that squall hit them and they capsized, You've got three kayakers in the water experiencing maximum intensity cold shock, complete loss of control of their breathing. One kayak remained, but probably with no paddles and certainly no pump. And at the same time, they're being swept out between those islands into the Atlantic Ocean by the ebb tide, and there's absolutely no way that they could possibly swim ashore. So let's look at the response what happened after they capsized. Brackett's wife, Cheryl, said that the float plan called for them to be back by 4.30 p.m. Now, let me point out, they capsized at three. So they're due back at four. When they didn't return, she eventually went down to the harbor to look for them. That's where these two lobstermen, Bruce Crowley and Lenny Young, saw, they see her pacing back and forth on the beach at 6.30 p.m. They go up, Cheryl, what's going on? Well, you know, the kayaks haven't come back yet. So Crowley's alarmed. He says, call the Coast Guard. And he and Young run to their boat and they head out to look for them. And I'd say, you know, so much for the float plan. Because from a practical standpoint, this is why a float plan isn't much help when an incident happens on cold water. Let's take a look at the search. In many respects, these searches are like looking for a needle in a haystack because victims are really difficult to spot out on the water. But Crowley and Young, the lobstermen, they're out there and they've got a plan. They have intimate local knowledge so what they do is they're, they're searching for, and it takes them an hour, an hour and a half, but an hour and a half later at 8 p.m., two and a quarter miles offshore, they find her. She's clinging to her kayak. She's been in the 52 Fahrenheit water for over five hours at that point. She's barely conscious, severely hypothermic, and she's taken to the hospital with a core temperature of 82 Fahrenheit. The only reason she didn't die is because she was able to get partially out of the water and onto the hull of her kayak. And even so, she barely survived. Now, a lot of boats participated in this search, as you can imagine, including the Coast Guard. But it was Crowley's intimate knowledge of that local area that produced the most effective search plan. It's very likely that he spotted Jennifer Popper first because she was still with her kayak. Half an hour later, he finds Michael Popper, he's dead. And it's another two hours before they find Brackett. So let's look at the major contributing factors. They're highlighted uh, here in, in yellow. I wanna, I wanna point out one of them in particular. Emergency gear like VHF radios, cell phones, strobe lights, and flares should be attached to your PFD where they'll be available if your kayak is lost. And another thing is that kayak tethers prevent boats from being blown away. This particular incident featured all three major hazards, cold water, adverse weather, and hazardous waters. And Looking at it in retrospect, a much safer time to do this trip would have been in the morning on the flood tide 
when the potential for squalls and thunderstorms was minimal. We're gonna look now at uh, one of the aspects of adverse weather that I think catches a lot of kayakers by surprise and results in a disproportionate number of close calls and fatalities, and that's wind shadows. Wind shadows are very common. They occur anytime that the wind is blocked by an, by an obstruction like houses or trees or terrain. And wind shadows mislead paddlers because when the wind is blowing offshore, the water at the shoreline is flat calm and the rougher conditions farther out on the water are hard to spot. Wind shadows don't create a problem until you leave the protection of the shadow. But as soon as you do, the wind suddenly increases. And unless you can turn your canoe or kayak or paddleboard around and paddle back against the wind, you're going to be blown further offshore into increasingly rougher water. This is where all that advice about skipping wetsuits or dry suits as long as you paddle close to shore and in protected waters falls apart and gets people into trouble because they are paddling in protected waters until suddenly they aren't. Now, if you look at this island here, this little diagram that I've got, the wind comes in over the water, it rises up when it reaches the land and then it blows across the land. Now, let's say the elevation on this island is 60 feet. When the wind clears the land again and is out over the water, it doesn't drop down immediately. It, it drops down gradually until it finally meets the water. And the area in between the shore and where the wind drops down and meets the, the water, that's your wind shadow. That's this area in here. It's going to look benign. It's not going to look rough. There aren't going to be any waves. It's not going to be windy. If you're paying attention, you can hear the wind up in the trees, but that area, no problem at all. It looks, it looks very, very innocent. This is our first uh, wind shadow incident that I want to talk to you about. This was a fatal incident that took the lives of Maeve McCain and her son Gideon. This was on Chesapeake Bay. You may have heard about it in the news. They were blown offshore while paddling a canoe. Uh, this particular tragedy got a lot of media attention because she was Robert Kennedy's granddaughter. Now let's take a closer look at it. This is an overview of the area. And once they were blown offshore right here, it would have been 20 miles down and across the Chesapeake Bay before they finally reached land. They never made it. They capsized within two and a half miles of the cove where they'd launched the canoe. Here's a close look at the cove. The wind's blowing offshore. There's a little breeze around those two houses and she and her son were kicking a soccer ball around the yard when it went into the water. The water's calm because of the wind shadow. And even though it's 51 Fahrenheit water, it doesn't look dangerous at all. So what they do is they just run over here. They're kicking the ball, goes in the water. They run over here. They've got a canoe. They just hop in. They paddle out. They're going to, you know, they're going to retrieve the ball. No PFDs, no protection, no cell phone. And the breeze is pushing that soccer ball away from shore. So they wind up chasing it a little bit and then suddenly the wind hits them. And you can see how that would happen. Your soccer ball is getting, it has almost no resistance on top of the water. It's flat water. So, you know, it's kind of getting pushed out here. They launch the canoe, they go out and then all of a sudden there's the wind. Canoes are notoriously difficult to manage in wind, particularly by a solo paddler. And as soon as they lost the protection of that wind shadow, there was absolutely no way that she was able, she could have, she just simply couldn't paddle back to shore. Now, if you ever find yourself in that set, uh, situation, remember the best survival strategy is to get down off the seats and sit or lie down on the bottom of the canoe to lower the center of gravity and reduce the risk of capsizing. They didn't know that. Uh, they capsized two and a half miles away and it was not a survivable situation. There was no way of re-entering the canoe, so what you're looking at is maximum intensity cold shock, swimming failure, and sudden drowning. 
And incidentally, none of the news reports understood what actually happened here. They mentioned things like tidal current. Uh, tidal current is, an, is not an issue in a little tiny cove like this. Here again, the major contributing factors uh, with the ones that pertain to this highlighted in yellow. So let's move on, let's look at another uh, adverse weather situation, and this is wave shadows. Um, this hazard is similar to wind shadows. Uh, large waves are blocked by an obstruction like a peninsula, an island, or a breakwater, and the protected water is much calmer, but as soon as you're out of the wave shadow, the waves suddenly increase in size. So in this picture, you've got four foot breaking waves on this shore of the island, but in here, you've got no waves at all. And you've got something of a wind shadow, uh, you know, close, closer to the land. As soon as you clear the wave shadow and, and, and the protection of the island, you're right out here, you've got four foot waves. You know, it doesn't go from like, no, you know, no waves to one foot and then to two foot. No, you've got those four foot waves coming right past the island. And also, uh, you're going to start feeling that 20 mile an hour wind that's driving them. So this is this next uh, incident that we're going to look at is a tragedy that combined wind and wave shadow. Location is the Apostle Islands. I don't know if you're familiar with it. It's a spectacular area on the southern edge of Lake Superior. And in this particular situation, four college students set out on a 2.3-mile uh, crossing from Sand Bay to Sand Island. The water temperature is 47 uh, Fahrenheit. They're wearing PFDs, but no thermal protection. They have no spray skirts, no cell phones or VHF radios. Now one paddler has a wetsuit with him, but he's not wearing it. So let's look at the conditions uh, so we can appreciate how this, how they fell into this trap. This was a windy day on Lake Superior. The wind was out of the north northeast at 25 to 30 miles an hour, and it had a very long fetch. And fetch is the distance uh, over which wind blows and it's not obstructed by anything. The fetch was over 70 miles and it was generating four foot waves marching across Lake Superior toward the Apostle Islands. Here's their intended route. Now, when they were launching here at Sand Bay, conditions looked fine from shore. But when they're two thirds of the way across, all of a sudden, they encounter much rougher water and higher winds. Two of the four kayaks capsized. One paddler wound up dying of drowning and hypothermia. So again, they launch here. Here's where they're going. That's where they capsize. So let's put the wind and the wave shadow into the picture. And here it is. As soon as they crossed that line, they were in trouble. Four-foot waves and wind coming at them from the side, which is as you know, the most precarious position for kayakers that don't have a lot of experience. Um, it was more than two of them could handle. I want to point out uh, one of my pet peeves, another piece of really bad advice that's given to paddlers all the time is that you can skip wearing a wetsuit or dry suit unless you plan on encountering challenging conditions. Well, these paddlers certainly didn't plan on encountering challenging conditions. You can see right here, York Island, that's what created the wave shadow and the wind, wind shadow to, to a lesser degree. As soon as they cross the line, they're in trouble. Seven major contributing factors uh, in this particular uh, tragedy. They weren't able to recover from the twin capsize. And it's not that easy to do a boat-to-boat -boat rescue in wind and four-foot seas, but that's what they needed to do. 
because losing your boat because it sinks or you can't get back into it or it blows away, that can be catastrophic, particularly in cold water. And I would say this is precisely why OOPS requires that members be able to do a successful wet exit and recovery. Another really important factor here was poor group management. When both kayaks capsized, the group made a decision to tow one of the paddlers to Sand Island, but they left the other one, Kevin Damon, behind. That was a fatal mistake. Damon was the one with the wetsuit in his boat, and he tried to put it on once he was in the water, but he could only get his legs into it because he couldn't get the wetsuit over his PFD. Now, when these other paddlers, the two paddlers that were towing the guy, when they reached Sand, Sand Island, one of them turns around and he paddles 2.3 miles back to the put-in. He calls for help. But by that time, Damon had been in the 47 Fahrenheit water for at least an hour. And it's really unlikely that he survived that long. The Coast Guard responded, other boats responded, and he was finally found by the Coast Guard at 8 p.m. That's at least three and a half hours after he capsized. He's floating dead in the water. He died of drowning and hypothermia. And even though the route was known, it took hours for searchers to find him. And it's worth pointing out that they were doing the best they could, but there were four foot waves out there. And the Coast Guard said he was very hard to spot because of his blue PFD. Let's move on uh, and take a look at hazardous waters, uh, looking at inlets. When water flows out of a bay or an inlet into the ocean through, through this narrow slot, the speed of the current increases, just like it did between those islands at the mouth of Goldsboro Bay in Maine that we just looked at earlier. Here's a fatal accident that's typical of inlets and river mouths. 19-year-old kayaker capsized in net hearts on the coast and drowned when the ebb tide swept her out over the bar. This was just last May. So she capsizes in here and the current's going out and it sweeps her into this, which are breaking large breaking waves all across the mouth. Incidentally, Lumpy Water Sea Kayaking Symposium 2011, a surf class with four instructors and 12 students got into trouble here. The paddlers were rescued um, by the local, uh, local rescue squad using jet skis, and fortunately, there were no fatalities. When you look at a map on your computer, uh, particularly if you're using a, a, a Google Chrome, you can... You can uh, you can switch to a satellite photo of the area on it. And if you do that to Netarts Bay, this is some of the stuff that you see. Very large swells, breakers, rough, confused water. And once, you're, uh, once you've looked at this a little, you can look in an area like this and you can see, gosh, it looks, you know, the texture looks, looks really odd. That's because these aren't uniform swells. This is water that's moving up and down in every different direction. It's, it's a very challenging environment uh, for a tiny kayaker. And this white dot right here, to scale, that's the size of a person's head. The large environment, a tiny person. Uh, and when you, when you look at this and you see, oh, you know, this looks a little lighter, maybe there's a little brown in it, that's because the water is shallow. Seven major contributing factors to this particular accident. Many of them, as you notice, we've already seen in these other incidents, but one that we haven't, paddling solo. Here's another rough place on the Oregon coast. This is the uh, inlet that empties into the Pacific from Coos Bay but there's nothing unusual about it. The same thing happens with inlets all over the world. But notice this here, it's 650 yards wide 
And look at this pattern here. Again, it's this cross hatch pattern. This water is moving up and down, up and down. It's, uh, it's a very difficult place to be if you don't have the skills to handle it. Now let's move on and take a look at a near fatal incident that involved current. I'm sure this location is familiar to any of you who've been to the Lumpy Waters uh, because it's Pacific City, Oregon. A kayak fisherman uh, capsized in, in surf close to shore. His problem was he couldn't get back on his sit on top kayak because his waders filled with water. So what he does, he hung on to the back of his buddy's back and they both figured this would be a quick tow into shore. Instead, the current takes them 600 yards out here to the headland of Cape Kiwanda, which is a very rough place to be um, because it's a headland. And that kind of feature concentrates wave energy. And these guys were helpless. There was no way to tow them into shore. shore. Current's too strong to paddle against. And by the time they've gone 600 yards and they wound up here, um, they're just, they're hammered, they're cold, they're scared, they're exhausted. And that's when they get rescued by a Coast Guard Hilo out of Astoria. They're lucky that Hilo was already out on a training mission and was able to divert and reach them quickly because it was all they could do to keep that, that kayak, that remaining kayak off of this area. Because the waves are trying to drive them in and this is not a good place to be. Talking about wave energy, I want, to, I want to say a little bit about convergence zones because waves behave in very interesting ways when they meet obstacles like headlands and islands. Uh, the interaction can be very complex and sometimes this can amplify the wave height causing breakers and very confused seas. This little diagram on the left is a simplification, but it indicates here we got an island and here come the waves and you see that they wrap around both sides of the island and they converge right here, this convergence zone. So over here might not be bad, but this is a place that you wanna, you wanna be careful of. If you look here, on the right-hand side, you see a better example of how this plays out in the real world. There are all sorts of intersecting patterns here. I mean, it's beautiful just looking at it, but it's, it's not a very good place to be. You know, you've got this kind of zipper formation going here and waves coming in here and reflecting back out. They're converging on this side of the island. They're gonna speed up as they go through that narrow area. It, it gives you a sense of what, what they can do. Now let's look at reflective wave, reflected waves. Here's a really good example of reflected waves creating big water. You notice out here uh, in the, uh, the bottom part of the picture, this is not very rough water. These are fairly smooth, even waves, but when they come in, they're hitting this vertical cliff. And the vertical cliff is reflecting them back in the same direction. When they meet, when one of these reflected waves meets one of the waves that's coming in and smacks into it, this is often the result. And this is something that, it's a, it's a wave phenomenon that we call clapatis. That is the nose of a kayak right there. So it gives you gives you an idea uh, of what can happen when these waves are, are reflected back from a surface. Here's an example, very spectacular example of Clopatis uh, at the mouth of the Columbia River um, at Cape Disappointment. Big Clopatis can hurl water hundreds of feet into the air. Or, you know, it can be smaller like this. You want to be aware of this kind of thing if you're paddling past a bulkhead and a boat weight comes along because these, particularly these smooth concrete bulkheads, they're very efficient at, reflected, at reflecting waves. So since paddlers, if you're paddling along the shore, 
you would encounter this reflected wave um, on the beam coming at you from the side. And, and this is a, an area frequently uh, uh, where people capsize. They're just not used to it. You know, they, they don't anticipate that boat, boat weight. Maybe it's even calmer than it is here in the picture. But the boat weight smacks into that, and reflects back out. It can, be, uh, it, it can make for some interesting paddling. Now let's take a minute to look at strainers. A strainer is anything that allows water to pass through, but that stops an object like a kayak or a person. Strainers don't look dangerous, and they aren't dangerous unless there's a current. But when there is a current, they can pin you and drown you. And that's true even if the current isn't very strong, because the force that that water exerts on a person or a boat is huge. Classic strainers are downed trees. Notice in the picture on the left, we've got two kayaks that have been capsized and pinned and they're stuck there. And it's gonna be very, very hard to remove them. Uh, oftentimes you can't even get near this because it's too, too dangerous. You have to wait until the water goes down. So that's two kayaks. Um, a classic strainer, here's another one, it's a tree. And again, if there's no current, there's no problem. But even if the current is just moving along like this, not very fast, that thing can pin you, capsize you, pin you and drown you. Here's a real nasty one. If you can't turn around and paddle back against the current and get ashore, this thing is gonna eat you and your kayak. Because this is a, a, a an area of strainers and debris that spans the entire river. The water has no, no problem at all passing through, but it's gonna stop you uh, or your kayak. This is another one. This is a river uh, when it's flooding, it's up above the banks. And what it's done here, it's created a sea of strainers. There is absolutely no way to safely get ashore in a boat or swimming when that river is running through there like that. Um, and talk about scary, check this out. This guy tries to get past this log jam, which is run up against the bridge. That's his little kayak right there. These are the rescue guys. They've rigged a hoist, very clever, from the top of the bridge to get down because there's absolutely, you know, they, there's no other way that they could reach him safely. Maybe a, a very efficient swift water rescue group, but it's dangerous. So they, they've decided to go down like that. Very easy to get pinned and drowned here. Let's take another look, a little closer look at it from a different angle. I guess he was thinking he was gonna go down through this tongue of water uh, where it, it's clear uh, beyond that and it runs under the bridge, but he misjudged it. There's a little blue kayak. So he thinks he's gonna just go here and what he doesn't appreciate is the water's not just running like this, it's also running under this debris pile. And it sucked him right into it and right there. He'd be dead except like me with the bridge I mentioned when we first got started, he reached up, grabbed a hold of a branch and pulled himself up on that debris pile just seconds before he would have been, he would have been sucked under there. Same kind of thing happened three years ago on San Francisco Bay. This time it was the Alcatraz Island dock. This was, uh, the guy that got stuck in this was a very skilled and experienced paddler, but he'd never encountered this kind of thing before. The kayak pulls right up here. It gets sucked under the dock. And he barely escaped. The kayak was stuck under that dock for about a week. Uh, it took two people to help pull him up onto the dock because his body was half under it, the current was really strong and he couldn't get a foothold. So he's just hanging on for dear life. And honestly, if he was by himself, he would have run out of strength and eventually been sucked under and killed. So watch out for those docks. Pacific Northwest, we have these wing dams. They're perfect strainers if the current is strong enough. 
and it doesn't take much to pin you or your boat. So watch out for wing bands. Anything like that, when there's a current, you do not want to get pushed into it. You want to give them a wide berth. I, want, I also want to talk about low head dams. Uh, we don't have many of them out here, but they are a fact of life in many, many parts of the country. And they are absolutely one of the most dangerous hazards that you can encounter on any river. The reason is because as the water flows over the dam, it, it makes a depression in the water and it water goes down like this. The surface water comes back to fill in that depression and it creates a pattern of recirculating water. So it'll suck you into the dam, it'll push you down and underwater, you'll come back up and the current's gonna carry you back in, you get pushed down, come back up, carries you back. Um, these are uniform across the entire river. So this is a swimmer right here, caught in what we would call the backflow, the backwash. He's being pulled toward the dam where he's gonna be pushed under, and it'll pop back up and get pushed under again. This right here is what in paddling circles we call a horizon line. If you're looking down the river, it's very difficult to spot these low head dams. But if you're paying attention, you can see a thin line that's a little bit unnatural. You can't see all of this stuff because it's below your line of sight. And the water tends to flow very smoothly toward the dam, nothing looks dangerous until all of a sudden you see all of this stuff, it's too late to turn around, you go over and it's gonna bring you back, capsize you and there you are. So um, here's another example. And this one uh, re really raises the hair on my back of my neck because this is ice on either side of the river. So you're coming down this river, you see that horizon line, there's nothing you can do. You can't get ashore because of the ice. The only thing you could do would be to turn around and paddle back against the current. Now, maybe you can do that, maybe you can't. If you can't, you're gonna get washed over the dam. And again, this is this uniform backwash. There's no way to get out of that other than by swimming to the side. And that's you know, that's, that's, really, that's really hard to do. There's a good reason why they call these things drowning machines. I heard a couple of us talking about fog when, uh, when the meeting was just getting started. Fog is something that's gonna test your navigation. And if you don't know where the shore is, um, it's not good. It's not good to be lost out in the fog. Other boats also can't see you. So that's a great reason to learn a little bit more about kayak navigation, have a compass on you, know how to use it, have a map, because you can, you can paddle in fog and, and do a good job of, of navigating, but you have to know how to do it. The other thing you wanna watch out for uh, is boat traffic. These large commercial boats, the kind that we encounter on the Columbia River, they're also, to a certain degree, on the lower part of the, the Willamette as you go through Portland. Um, they're huge. Um, they can't turn, they can't stop, and they probably can't see you. And they're moving faster than they look. Uh, their speed, it, it's a trick your mind plays. It looks like they're going slower. You might think that, well, you have plenty of time to get across the river before they get to you. Um, and that's not a game of chicken that I want to play with something like that. You don't want to be here either because this is a situation that gives kayakers a really bad name. This boat's heading into a dock and these folks are just fiddling around out there completely clueless. The unhappy captain, trust me, is going to be laying on the horn. You, you want to know where the docks are you should be looking at a chart if you're paddling in these waters so you know where the ferry channels are, things like that, so you don't get in a situation like this where you're interfering with navigation. You don't wanna be here either. Uh, that's a US Coast Guard 47 foot motor lifeboat, uh, but surfing is not what we're gonna cover today. I'd say 
If you want to take up kayak surfing, if you want to play out in the ocean and the waves, learn from a real pro. That's Bill Vonnegut. Call him up. He'll hook you up. Uh, Pacific Coastal Kayaking. And trust me, Bill doesn't pay me to do an ad like, like this for him. Uh, I mention it because he is one of the finest sea kayaking instructors I've ever met. And I think he's a treasure. And so any of you that really want to play in the surf and learn how to do this safely, I think Bill's your guy. And that brings us to the end of the class. Uh, you can spread the word about cold water safety by referring people to our website, linking to it on social media when a question comes up about paddling on cold water. And if you'd like to help the center, you can go to our website and click on the Get Involved Donate tab because that makes a big difference. Uh, we're a nonprofit tax exempt organization and we're also run entirely by volunteers. We don't accept advertising, we don't accept corporate donation, and we don't have memberships or dues. We don't charge for access to our website. And it's private donations that make that possible, private donations that allow us to be an independent voice for cold water safety. So that's my pitch. 